everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to another session of uh, the Dharma Stream with uh, Lampo Viradamo. Uh, before I begin, uh, may I please invite everyone, if you can, if, if it's convenient, uh, to please turn on your video so that uh, Lampo could see you and be connected to you uh, virtually via eye contact. Uh, I'm sure he's looking at you uh, using the gallery view now. Uh, it'll be very nice for the teacher to be speaking to someone, a face on screen, than to a blank piece of uh, looking at himself on screen. So I'd like, to invite, you. <laughs> I'd like to invite you all, if you can, turn on your videos so that uh, you can be connected to Lumpur. Right, so now we're at the, the top of the hour. I'd um, like to now uh, welcome everyone to the session. Uh, if we can all put our palms together and pay respects to Lumpo to welcome him in as we begin the session. Uh, first bow, please. Second bow. And third bow. Over to you, Lumpo. Over to me. Okay, shall we start with some meditation? We'll meditate for about half an hour. I'll say a few words, but we'll sit mostly in silence. So whatever works for you in meditation, go for it. So just some preliminary instruction. Listen to sound. Bring the mind to silence. Listen. Let go of thinking. Listen. Let go of the past and future. Just listen. And notice the mind, which is silent, even though there is sound. Notice the silence of awareness. And be that awareness. Feel your hands. Feel the tactile sensations in your hands. Let go of thought, feel the body, feel your hands. Let the feelings in the hands become conscious. Doesn't really matter what's there. And notice the silence of awareness. Listen to sound. Perceive sound as in awareness. Sound is an object in awareness. A go of thought. Feel your hands. Receive the hands, the sensations in the hands as in awareness. Let go of thinking. Listen to sound. Notice the silence of awareness. Change the sense object, feelings in the hands. Notice the silence of awareness. Sense objects are different. Silence of awareness is the same. Let that be the background. Silent awareness. And let the foreground be the sense experience of sound or 
memory or bodily feeling, thought, that's the foreground. Listen to sound. Notice the background awareness, not dependent on sound. Feel the body. Notice the background awareness, not dependent on body. Be that awareness. So let go of objects and try to notice objects, sights, so sounds, memories, feelings, emotions, all that coming and going in the space and background of awareness. Be that awareness. So don't choose a, an object of meditation, but be the witness of change. When you get all caught up, thinking past, future, at some point you notice that, return to the background. Turn to awareness, silent no, and be that silent knowing. So just be very patient and keep awakening to the background. Be the background. These are ways of talking. All right, we'll just sit quietly with those ideas.
All right, let's stop there. Good evening, Long Paul. Shen Seeing, how are you? I'm good. How are you? You got a haircut. Yes, Long Paul. <laughs> Please go ahead, yeah. <clears throat> so we'll now request for the Dhamma. Brahma Jaloka Dipati Sahampati Katanjali So hello everyone, nice to see familiar faces. Always good to be with you. Thank you, Bita, as always, for organizing this gathering. I think it's the, do I have another one in October? And then, then I'll be with you in Singapore. Right. Okay. So here at Tisserna, it's very beautiful right now. It's, uh, it was temperature wise, nine degrees last night. And today it was about 23. So this is for us the beginning of the autumn, which is just the most fabulous season for me. Uh, the, maple leaves, the maple leaves are changing color. Uh, the deer are all frisky, eating apples. And we have some lovely guests staying with us at the monastery. So all is good. Two of the monks are sick. Ajahn Pabro has shingles which is a nasty, nasty, ah, it's a lot of pain. And Achan uh, Venerable Amr Siri has some issues. Uh, there you go, that's life. Uh, last week I was teaching a retreat in Arnprior, which is a town close to here, about an hour by car. And it's our annual September retreat organized by the Ottawa Buddhist Society. Um, and it's the most exquisite environment right on the Ottawa River at the confluence of the Ottawa and Madawaska Rivers, an old, an old uh, timber baron's house, which was converted into a, a, a nunnery by the Oblate Order. And uh, this, the retreat was just very, very silent. Mixed. And we've been, like I say, we've been doing this for 20 years, and some of the people on the retreat have been part of that retreat for many, many years. So it's very re rewarding. And then I just found that the retreat centers closed next year. So that was sad, such a, such a lovely venue. Uh, but that's of course the way it is. So now I'm back at the monastery after, after a retreat, I like to get my psyche buried into manual work. I just like to forget about Dhamma, forget about teaching, not be the, the guy out front, just, uh, and just go into some kind of different mode uh, so that I can see myself in a different kind of environment. Because this very strange being a senior monk. People are always looking at you. Um, they are. <laughs> and they even like in airports with this robe on, people are always looking. So. <laughs> I've gotten used to it, but I do like being in, in, in some kind of different environment. So I've been uh, spending a lot of time weaving in the last week and uh, making rugs for monastery or whoever. 
and I just as I was weaving the other day I just thought how very much this is um, you know we have the idea of practice this is a very important word um, and so now in the weaving I'm a, at, a at, a, at a stage where I understand the how to set it all up and how to get it going so that's a considerable that was a considerable learning curve for me which is good and interesting but now now I kind of know what I'm doing uh, and now it's just getting into the rhythm of trying to really embed this um, craft into my bones into my body just doing again and again and again and again and again and again and again um, and that that's very much how our practice should should I think naturally it does evolve in that way where in, like if I think back to my early days as a young monk, the, all the conceptual structures, dependent origination, and three characteristics, and four noble truths, and right effort, and the ten paramitas, and the four Brahma Viharas, and you, you know, we have these incredible lists, and uh, trying to piece all that together as one unified. Um, a set of ideas which was consistent that I could understand the place of all these different ideas in the whole uh, project of enlightenment. That took a long time, um, but that was worthwhile, that kind of study and contemplation, study and contemplation and asking questions. And that's the kind of learning curve that I had to do and I think we all have to do intellectually. And that's very important to do that. This kind of gathering is not for that. I'm not an academic. I don't lay out the list. So if you haven't really put the time into the structures of intellectual structures of Theravada Buddhism, it's a very, very good exercise to do to, to pick up the Four Noble Truths and say, what are the words? There's suffering, the cause, the end, and the path. What do those words mean? Uh, and grapple with the three characteristics or depend on origination either through reading, through asking questions, through um, YouTube programs or whatever. And, and that is a, there's an intellectual work to be done there where intelligence is used in that way. Um, and what's, I think, important in that vein is that you do differentiate between one tradition or another tradition. So it's okay to delve into um, Tibetan Buddhism or Rinzai Zen or Soto Zen or even Christian mysticism or uh, Advaita Vedanta. There's so many different schools that talk about um, the spiritual possibilities of human consciousness. But if you're not careful and you just mix, mix and take a bit of this and a bit of that, you can get confused because the terms uh, are oftentimes used differently. Um, so do try to be consistent, like learn learn one tradition and, and, and learn it well. Um, and then what you'll find, what I found is because I've obviously committed myself to the structures of Theravada Buddhism, now I can um, read from other traditions and I've got a background from which I can question or contemplate what other traditions might say. So there is that. So this kind of gathering again is not really about that. So I expect most of us have enough experience that we can, I uh, think, you know, we don't have to go to kind of basic things. Um, <clears throat> so in, in this kind of weaving project, um, all the time that I'm doing the weaving, all the time that I'm applying my, my hands and my intelligence, to this craft, uh, all the time I'm con I'm participating in right understanding, understanding how how the yarn fits, how the colors fit, how the sequence of petals fit, uh, how to do this and that. So right understanding is always there, and and the same in developing uh, our own um, path path to liberate the heart from suffering, the path of enlightenment, right understanding is always there. It has to be there. Otherwise, my intentions, the way I work, the, what I do, it goes askew because there isn't right understanding. So right understanding sometimes is translated as a right view. That can sound like you have a kind of Buddhist position. 
as opposed to a whatever position. But it's not really about that. It's about the intelligence of understanding what I'm doing, my intentions in, in, in what I, how I'm doing something, uh, understanding how the results of my intentions create good effects or bad effects. And this is panya, this is wisdom, the capacity not only to be in the world and do, do things in the world, but really see, see my inner world, to see my inner world and what the consequences of my actions and speech and intentions, especially intentions, are in my inner world. And so in, 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 in Buddhist, uh, in Theravada Buddhism, we always, as you know, we always differentiate between the conventional reality and the Dharma reality. And the way I like to think about the conventional reality is who we are as social beings in the, um, in the kind of social situations we find ourselves. So uh, I'm a man, I'm an older man, I'm a monk, I've been a monk such and such a time, I live in Canada, and so on and so forth. And then someone else has a different social position. And in that area of Buddhism, we always talk, as you know, about morality, generosity, developing compassion, developing kindness and sensitivity to others, uh, being responsible uh, for the planet, being responsible for the water and the trees, um, living within the rule of law of our countries, and so on and so forth. And much of our time is taken up with that, being a person in the world of things, in the world of, of time, in the world of responsibilities. But meditation, and, and, and so in, in that sense, it's very important to develop a, a kind of um, second level of, of intelligence, let's say, or a second level of attention, where we're not just in the foreground of dealing with people or talking with them or whatever doing. We also have a sense of what's going on in our inner world. So if I'm um, talking with someone and it starts to get, uh, we start to have a disagreement, Obviously, my inner sensitivity knows, oh, you're going towards anger there, Dhamma, or you're going towards judgment, or you're going towards domineering, or where are you going with this? And that's a kind of background attention which we should always have. If we don't have that, of course, we're just reactive. There's no real contemplation. We're just reactive. We, we like someone, we react in that way. We just dislike someone, we react in that way. And that's no freedom. That's no freedom at all. That's just... Uh, being a leaf in the wind, being blown around by circumstances. So circumstances are there, right? The good, bad, and the uh, indifferent. But our our capacity to pay attention to our inner world as as we live this this uh, worldly existence is obviously very important. And one of the ways to do that is to develop that in meditation. So this meditation, which I suggested which is sometimes, I think in Japanese, it's called shikinpaza or choiceless awareness, is a way of cultivating the background, cultivating awareness and watching the world of sense experience of memories and thoughts and emotions and uh, sound, physical feeling, all the rest of it, arise and cease in awareness. This is very difficult to do, very difficult to do. But it's not really choiceless awareness because we are choosing. We're choosing, we're choosing witnessing as opposed to participating. And this, in a way, is putting the world down, You're not, not putting it down, uh, putting it down. Uh, it's just like <laughs> putting it down, <laughs> like not lifting the world up. And, and this is really, I think, the, the great beauty of meditation is that we take, we develop the skill to not engage the world, to not try to fix the world problems. Not all the time, because we can't. We have to. We live in the world and we have worldly responsibilities. But if we can never you know, lay the world down, just let it rest for a while, then we'll, our mind never rests. And so meditation oftentimes is, uh, in Thailand, is known as a way of resting the mind. As opposed to trying to get something or attain something. And I often talk about this, that the, my, my own background in, in Buddhism comes not so much from scripture or, or dogma, but comes from my teachers. That's my, my, my good fortune is that I've had very, very good teachers, Lompa Cha, Lompa uh, Sumedho and others, that have guided me in ways, and their emphasis has never been on attainment. 
or getting something. It's always been you know, emphasizing, letting go, non-attachment, non-grasping. And so these words are much more important to me than attainment. Attainment, I don't, I've, I don't trust that kind of language because quite often that in my own practice has led to greed and then frustration and, and disappointment. Where to me, the, the third noble truth, uh, Niroda, is about letting go. It's about the abandonment of the attachments to craving and wanting. So if you, if you meditate, quite often we meditate with a technique, fine. Or with an object, fine as well. But to try to actually just abide as a witness to the way things are is, is a very skillful thing to do because that way of participating in the present moment then can be a way that you strengthen that capacity to witnessing in ordinary life, not just on the cushion. So if I've struggled through an hour of meditation and my mind has been um, kidnapped by this plan or that plan, this thing and that thing, uh, some memory, some resentment, um, some image of a television program or whatever it might be, it's quite hard to just return to the suchness of awareness. But if you do that and you, and you, and you persist with it, um, then in that persistence you develop a strength, the strength of witnessing. If you don't persist in it, then quite often the attention is always driven by objects, objects you like, objects you dislike, especially thought, especially thought, you're driven by that. And, and, and doing this, this kind of strengthening of witnessing is very much like myself now, weaving. You know, kind of, I kind of get it. I get what weaving is about. I get what this machine is about. So in some sense, in meditation, you have to get it, why we emphasize witnessing or awareness of the way things are or awareness of change. Why is that important? Well, it's important because no object can liberate you. No experience can liberate you. The object-less awareness itself is not an object. And that is the gateway to enlightenment. That's the gateway to spirituality. That's where we find our real home. So many ways that we might talk about that. So it's, it's very, very important. If you get that, if you get that, then just as in the weaving, I kind of get what I'm supposed to be doing there. Then I, then I develop the skills of throwing the shuttles back and forth and shifting the pedals and so on. I, I, I just do it. I just do it until it becomes second nature. Again. So also with witnessing, um, how could that become second nature? I, if we didn't know this, if we didn't know this, of course, we'd be bonkers. We just react to any old emotion and, and we'd be a mess. We'd be a real mess. But witness when you are a mess. You know, when, when, when you really got to get messed up by life, what happens is, you know, the world just grabs, grabs our attention. We become born into our thoughts, into our emotions and, and the whole nine yards of that. And that's being born again into the world of suffering. So witnessing, developing witnessing in, in situations which are not complex, which are not um, difficult and fraught, i.e. a meditation room, uh, uh, a situation where nature is, is kind to you, where, the, where the, the social situation isn't demanding. That's why it's important to actually take time out, sit down, and begin to develop that witnessing consciousness. Now, how, what is it about ordinary life that is so compelling and, and, and compelling in the way of the world? Or what, what drives the compelling nature of the world? Why, why, do, we, why do we spend so much time um, not witnessing, say? If you understand what witnessing is, witnessing is the silent awareness of the way things are, the silent attention of the way things are. That's actually very ordinary. It's not, it's not very far away. It's here at any moment, any moment. It's a, it's a possibility. Why don't we abide there? If any, if any of us have done any meditation, abiding there is actually quite pleasant. It's not like getting a tooth pulled. It's, 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 it's not really painful because it's very, very silent, it's spacious. It's empty. It's empty of what? It's empty of ego thinking. Ego thinking, what is ego thinking? Ahankara mimankara, we say in Pali, it's all that, all that thinking which creates the world, the world of perceptions and conceptions. 
it's all the the thoughts of resentment. I did all the work and no one helped me and I, I'm just the most, and, or it's the, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done something else. Or why did they say that to me? It's not fair. And oh my gosh, this, my my knee is really bad. I must be getting old. I, my memory is just down the tube. And thinking in an egotistic way, in a self-making way is the problem. That's what the world is. Thinking logically, thinking rationally, how much of our thinking is actually what percentage of our thinking is just good, rational, functional thinking? 5%? 10%? And how much of it is just like unskillful habit, unskillful habit? And, and, and if, if, if we begin to witness that, and, and I think we all have witnessed that, it's very hard actually to get out of those traps of I making, my making. Because they're so very real and compelling and, and the world is a compelling place because of that so what to do well one of the ways to develop a stronger sense of witnessing is to use a word say it deliberately and at the end of the word notice the silence you say any word but a word which is maybe which triggers a, a sense of the path would be very helpful but you could say like if i if i just say the word viradhamma and I, and I pay attention at the end of the word, it's silent. It's silent, isn't it? You can use any word. Now, if you took one word, which was kind of inspiring for you, and, and sort of was a, was a key word that could bring you to that silence, that'd be very helpful. And then you'd be like the weaver. You'd be like the weaver throwing the shuttle, doing the pedals, but you'd use the word to bring yourself to witnessing, to the background, to the silence of awareness. So I was just, I've been playing around with the word I. <laughs> now the word I is actually the most powerful word you probably have in your vocabulary because it's running through your head all the time. I feel tired, I feel bored, I wish I was here, I wish I wasn't here. It's a very powerful word actually, I. But usually I is related to some Thing like tired, I am tired, or I am viradhamma, or I am a man, or I am a monk. So I was thinking, you know, what would really a good way to use the word I and relate it to something else? Well, what if I said I am awareness? That'd be interesting. I am awareness. Not as an ego thing, but I am awareness. That doesn't that make sense. Or as some kind of philosophical absolute, or not in a kind of academic way, I am awareness. But what if you said that? Let's say you notice, let's say you're, you're, you've got too much work and you've got the burden of work and your mind starts to throw up. It's not fair. I do all the work. No one else does it. It's not fair. And, and into that, and you had enough witnessing, you need witnessing consciousness to notice. Into that, it's not fair. I do all the work. No one helps me. You threw in, I am awareness. What would happen? Wouldn't the world just dissolve? Of course, it would come up 10 seconds later. It's not fair. I do everything. And da, 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 da. What if you said, I am awareness? What would happen? If you really listened, the world would stop. Because you know the silence of awareness. You know the background. If you really listened, if you just did it, parrot, I'm, I'm awareness, I'm awareness, da, da, da. That wouldn't bring you to the silence of the mind. So using a word, a mantra, a suggestion, if you understand that, then you come to the background. If you use Lampo Semedo's word, it's like this. You know, we were, we were listening to a talk yesterday of his. I wasn't. I was playing hooky. But my friends here, they were listening to the talk. And the title of the talk was... Do our hunts enjoy ice cream? I don't have cool titles like that. But apparently, what was the word? They do? It's, it's okay. Our hunts enjoy ice cream. So that's, that's good. Good to know. But anyway, what Lompo, if you listen to Lompo's talks, and what's he, what's he constantly encouraging us to do? He's encouraging us to do. So it's like this. Now, He's not just saying that you 
you dismissively put that, oh, it's like this, and just keep thinking. I don't think so. I think his suggestion is one of to touch the silence of awareness. Because if you really do that, it's like this. You have to stop. You have to stop to notice this moment. You have to be attentive. But not, not super focused, just attentive into the present moment. Whatever way it is, whether it's pleasant or, or, or hot or cold or good, bad, or painful or happy, it's just that, that moment of attentive presence. It's like this. And then there's the silence. And you're in the gateway. You're in the gateway of liberation. And then, and then what happens? 10 seconds later, it's not fair. Life is not fair. I have to all the work. I am aware. I am awareness. It's like this. So do you have, do you have, a, do you have a kind of consistent practice on these things? Or is it haphazard? Is it like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I like that one. And then... Oh, I like, do you actually have a consistent way of doing this? And this is what we mean by practice. It's not just being inspired by something. Inspiration is good, isn't it? But it's like understanding and then applying that understanding with whatever language, whatever intention, whatever effort you want to make. But insight, it, insight is good, but insight can be forgotten. You might understand this. But then it, the world can just kind of overwhelm you with its demands and, and it's all its injustices and all the rest of it. So insight needs to be cultivated through right understanding and then what right effort, right thinking, right effort, right mindfulness. And those are very dynamic things that you're practicing all the time. Not to get anywhere, not, not to get anywhere. You're not kind of building up something. You're letting go into the presence of witnessing silence. So it's a letting go. You're letting go of the world, letting go of this whole ahankara, mimankara, thinking, manufacturing. So I was playing around with that today. I, I am awareness. It was very nice, very nice. I woke up and I felt, I think the day after the retreat, I woke up, I am tired. Now for me, I am tired isn't just about being tired. It's a whole bunch of other associations. I am tired. It's not, it's not self-pity. It's like, I am, you know, I get lazy and so on and so forth. But as soon as I said, I am awareness, the tiredness is just an object. And anything that the mind wanted to create around the tiredness fell away. So many other things are like that. It's not just the perception of tired. It's a whole person being born into the perception of, uh, uh, no one helps me, or um, I shouldn't have said that, or I'm too loud, or too whatever. Let's say, let's say you you suffer from strong sense of self judgments, huh? and and so you say something, and oh, I shouldn't have said it that way. I should have. I am awareness. That's a different. That's a different perception, and it's not a perception that you can really hang on to anything. It's the background. It's space. It's silence. It's witnessing. We can certainly make judgments, fine. And, and we can function in that way. If I'm tired, I can do something about it. But how much of all those perceptions and conceptions of me and mine create this world, this world of thought and, and past and future? How much of our, how much of our bandwidth is, is taken up past, future, past, future? For what end? Quite often not, not skillful just habitual, just very, very habitual. And then maybe we judge that. Oh, one thing said, I should not be in the past and I should not be in the future. That's another ahankara, bimankara. It goes on and on and on. But in any given moment, it's like this. I am awareness. You come back to the silence of the mind. And, and so we talk about the gap between thoughts, the end of a thought. And you see, it's extraordinarily difficult to remember that to remember that, let alone practice it. It's not, you know, for human beings, because we are so compelled by our thinking minds and our self-identities and, and, and so on and so forth. But it is a worthwhile project because in the silence of attention, something new can come up, something fresh can come up. The doors to deathless are open, that's a possibility. We're available to deeper insights and deeper understandings, but if, 
If our attention is always preoccupied with the old, with the old sense of self and past and future, all the old identities that we have as human beings, there are judgments and so on and so forth, then that, that, that old stuff precludes the possibility of anything fresh and new and inside manifesting into consciousness because we're preoccupied. So we're not available. You're not available. As soon as you say, I am awareness, or it's like this, and you notice the silence, and you begin to honor that and treasure that and witness that and abide as that in longer and longer time spans, then you, you begin to see how the heart really opens. We're, we're, we're the Brahma Viharas, we're compassion, all these beautiful aspects of human character manifest from the silence of the mind. Insight manifests from the silence of the mind. You understand yourself better. Silence is the most simple. Thought, self, is more complex. Why do we go to the complex? Habit. It's just habit. But it's insidious habit. It's powerful habit. You can't dismiss it. It's the habit of maybe like 20, 30, 40 years of thinking in a particular way. Right? Of emoting in a particular way. So picking up this craft of liberation, the unshakable deliverance of the heart is a craft, is, 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 uh, is arduous in the sense it has to be, you have to really apply this kind of continuous attention, continuous attention to the way things are, and then just continue to let go and awaken to the silence of the mind. So there's some reflections. I offer those for your consideration. Thank you, Don Paul. Andamaya o Varagatha Sadhu Karan Kadamasi Sadhu 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 Anumodami. This is what should. Through the goodness that arises from my practice, may my spiritual teachers and guides of great virtue, my mother, my father, and my relatives, the sun and the moon, and all virtuous leaders of the world, may the highest gods and evil forces, celestial beings, guardian spirits of the earth, and the Lord of Death, may those who are friendly, indifferent, or hostile, may all beings receive the blessings of my life, may they soon attain the threefold bliss, and realize the deathless, through the goodness that arises from my practice, and through this act of sharing, may all desires and attachments quickly cease, and all harmful states of mind until I realize Nibbana in every kind of birth. May I have an upright mind with mindfulness and wisdom, austerity and vigor. May the forces of delusion not take hold nor weaken my resolve. The Buddha is my excellent refuge unsurpassed is the protection of the Dhamma. The solitary Buddha is my noble guide. The Sangha is my supreme support. Through the supreme power of all these, may darkness and delusion be dispelled. Okay, everyone. Okay, so uh, before we let you go, let us all now form a few respects and take you from one for. Arahan Sama Sambuddha Bada Buddha Bada Wanda Nabriva Devi Swata Do Bada Wata Dhamma Subhadi Bani Bhagavata Sawata Sangha Sangha Namah
Thank you, Long Paul. Thank you, Vita. Thank you. Okay. See you. See you next time, everyone. Be well. Stay healthy. Ciao.